Well, there are leaked messages from New York Times editors and journalists as they debated whether or not to give Israel the benefit of the doubt over that hospital bombing. Vanity Fair has obtained internal messages where one New York Times editor wrote, you don't want to hedge it, about the paper's headline claiming that Israel was responsible for the hospital strike. A junior journalist who is based in Israel then wrote, better to hedge. And yet the New York Times went ahead with a strong headline on their homepage claiming that Israel was responsible for a hospital bombing that had killed 500 Palestinians. A senior editor then wrote on the Slack channel, the headline on the homepage goes way too far. And an international editor then said, as you can see on your screen, I think we can't just hang the attribution of something so big on one source without having tried to verify it. The editor said, and then slap it across the top of the homepage. Putting the attribution at the end doesn't give us cover if we've been burned and we're wrong. Well, of course, as you know, they were burned by Hamas, as was most of the international media. There were three lies that the New York Times and many other media outlets published. The first was, well, Israel wasn't responsible for the strike. Palestinian Islamic Jihad was. Secondly, the hospital wasn't bombed, the car park was. And thirdly, 500 people weren't killed. The real number was closer to 50, according to Israeli officials. Now let's bring in tonight's political panel, National Senate Leader Bridget McKenzie and former Labor MP Michael Danby. Welcome to you both, Bridget and Michael. Bridget, Good evening, Sherry. the New York Times and Hi. many other media outlets, including the ABC in Australia, were very quick to take the lies or to take the word of Hamas rather than <laughs> actually engage in a proper reporting process. Yeah, Shari, I think it really has shown the issue with activist journalism. I mean, it's a time-honoured tradition that journalists are men and women of integrity, they protect their sources, but they are in the search of truth and leaving it up to the reader to decide their own opinion uh, once the truth is out there. And I think this situation has exposed great holes in the integrity of news organisations, not just here at home, but right around uh, the world. I think it's appalling that they would take the word of Hamas, a registered terrorist organisation, over actually doing their job. Michael, I made the point earlier that, you know, at least the New York Times has admitted they were wrong, published an apology of sorts, the BBC did the same. But what about all the other media outlets who published erroneous information and haven't put out any statement saying that they were wrong, correcting the record. It's so important that they do, and uh, both Bridget and you are right to say that uh, organisations should. This is an information war as well as a civilizational mm -hmm. war that's taking place there on the ground. Um, Russia Today and the Iran's mouthpiece and Hamas's mouthpiece, Al Jazeera, are bad enough. But it's terrible when the BBC and uh, the New York Times you know, gang up uh, on Israel. I have to say I'm s astonished that MSNBC and CNN, which are sort of left-wing uh, outlets, have been relatively fair on this. And that's because, unlike the New York Times or the BBC, they understand the horror of what went on there. This is civilizational. This is something that Albo mm. has to understand. Macron's over there. Olaf mm. Scholz is over there. This is one of the most barbaric events uh, in all of the hu human history. And really, people should stand up and say, so far and no further. Mm -mm. Absolutely, mean, Michael. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, and the fact that it's the New York Times. I mean, there's 1.6 million uh, Jews living in New York itself. Uh, so it seems to me it's not just bad ethically and morally at that sort of behaviour and reporting, but also a bad for their bottom line. Yeah, but it's seen as a paper of record. This is a decade old. So pro damaging, but but also the fact you're, that you're right, this Sherry. It's a decade old pro problem. Yeah. There's this equivalence yeah. that's emerging in the media where they're saying, oh, one side, oh, the other side. But you can't do that when you've got Israel and a terror organisation. And how can anyone expect a terror organisation that has beheaded and slaughtered babies and burned babies, babies not to lie? Oh, they wouldn't lie. Oh, but they would kill and burn babies. I mean, it's, it's obscene. There is no equivalence here between the two sides. Um, but let me ask my next question. 
Bridget, what did you make of that hostile questioning today of the Israeli ambassador, particularly by the ABC journalist? Yeah, look, I thought it was absolutely appalling, Shari. And I was going to say it sort of goes on from exactly uh, what you were saying. I mean, we are seeing here in Australia journalists from our nationally publicly funded broadcaster attacking an ambassador who rightly simply stated a fact that Israel was a victim of Hamas's attack. That is a simple fact. Those babies were innocent victims of terrorism. And they didn't start this war. Now, if, if that is somehow going to be a contested fact in a place like Australia, I'm really concerned about the level of integrity of our journalists, particularly in uh, publicly funded entities that should know better. Mm. Well, let's have a look at... Let's talk about this article that you're now seeing on the screen. The ABC, on its a ABC AM radio coverage, ran a conversation about that Israeli hostage who was released last night. Now, Jenna Clark in The Australian Today reports that the ABC in that segment ignored elements of Yochefed Lifshitz's experience, ignored the horror of her experience, and instead gave Hamas glowing coverage. Michael, what do you think about that? Mm. Well, there's no way of redress with the ABC. That's the problem, Sherry. Your critics at Media Watch uh, over there will never evaluate the importance of, uh, you know, pro-Palestinian elements in the ABC like John Lyons versus the so-called editor, Mr Anderson. Um, so, you know, it's like the New York Times. You know, they drove one of their greatest journalists, Barry Weiss, out of there, out of there the Staff Collective. And the Staff Collective uh, here does uh, whatever they like. We give them a billion dollars and they're completely unaccountable. Uh, that bloke over in the uh, in the Middle East who who said the the, the baby murders mm, didn't happen. At I'm least he's been transferred out to Turkey. Congratulations! But it's only due to Sophie Ellsworth and mm. your critics on Sky that there's any accountability at all. Mm, mm, exactly. Uh, now the I think what's really concerning is is we've now got local councils such as the council in I think Southwest Sydney yep. who is flying the Palestinian flag, a unanimous decision uh, until this war, you know, Gaza is no longer under fire. I mean, this is critical importance to a country like ours who should be standing with Israel and the Labor government um, needs to stand up and make it clear that that type of rhetoric, that that type of unaccountability, uh, that and particularly this local council is uh, taking, is unacceptable. Mm, and they had a minute silence as well. I, I played uh, <sighs> parts of it on my show a bit earlier. Michael, I mean, you, a former federal Labor MP in Canberra, um, I wish you hadn't left because we need strong pro-Israel voices there, but I'd love to hear your you. view on the conflict that we're seeing within the Labor Party. And, you know, I know you touched on it before, but again, on Albanese not backing in that call from Emmanuel Macron mm. for an international coalition to fight uh, Hamas. And instead, he talks about humanitarian aid. Well, what do you think of that, Danby? Uh, he, he says the, uh, the right thing in a bloodless, perfunctory kind of way. But can you imagine Bob Hawke um, not responding to Golda Meir's uh, request to go up to the Golan Heights uh, when the 1973 war happened. Of course, it it, it was uh, was different then. The first person in Israel um, after that bloodbath by Hamas was the the Social Democrat from Germany, Olaf Scholz. And and Anthony, get your head around the fact this is a civilizational mm. issue. This is not something just affecting Jews and Israelis and you know all of those troublesome people who annoy you. It's something where these people are going to come for us. Now, let me tell you the next thing that'll happen. Because of the woke and weak New South Wales and Victorian police, the ASIO director has said an opportunistic or, or spontaneous attack will happen. Um, we are going to have these people empowered. And the kind of things we've seen in the Middle East could well happen here. Be we need to have a firm hand to see those kinds of gas the Jew rallies mm. don't happen. And the New South Wales police have empowered them. And I'm afraid the Director General of ASIO's uh, assessment that um, yeah. we face an opportunistic or spontaneous attack is going to yeah. happen. Oh, God. God forbid. Uh, Bridget, we're out of time, but I just quickly want to ask you whether you think Australia should join an international coalition to fight Hamas. 
Uh, well, I think the Prime Minister should get on the phone to the Prime Minister of Israel, quick, smart. I think he should actually hey, hey, yeah. call in, like Rishi, Rishi Sunak has had the guts to do, like even Biden has had the guts to do. It's the least he can do on his way home uh, and show not just the Jewish community here at home that they matter to their Prime Minister, but the democracy matters to Michael's great point about this being a civilisational issue. He must right. stand up. All right, sorry, we're completely out of time. Bridget McKenzie, Michael Danby, thank you both so much.